really thrilled that my friend Jim Keat is um, here with us this morning. Um, I first met Jim when he came, when he was working for Sparkhouse, and he and Bethany Stoley came to Upper Dublin several years ago because they were doing a project about confirmation, and they attended our confirmation Sunday, interviewed a bunch of us about our confirmation program, and really hit it off, and we've been swimming in the same circles and friends ever since. Uh, Jim does a ton of digital work in ministry, so he's a, he's a, a pastor. Uh, he's the digital minister at the Riverside Church in New York on the Upper West Side, the big, big, uh, amazing Riverside Church in New York. Uh, and he also uh, works for Convergence. And uh, to tell you, every week he is, among the many other things he does, he hosts uh, Zoom gatherings for ministry leaders to help them figure out how to be the church online during this time. Uh, with lots of practical advice and lots of support. And I have asked Jim many questions since we had to go online about making the most of our church time together. Um, and I've been wanting Jim to be able to do this for us um, for some time. And then we ran into each other in Savannah just before, um, just before the quarantine hit. So Jenny and I went down to Savannah Jim uh, and his wife Chelsea were staying in Tybee Island in their Airstream and we had lunch, we caught up. It was like our last kind of outing before the quarantine. And I uh, said, so we've got to do this. So I'm glad we're doing that now. Um, so welcome Jim, I remind everybody if you just wanna mute and turn off your video for now, it helps us capture everything for the recording later. And then we're gonna open it up and have a conversation and be able to ask questions for Jim. So Jim, I'm just gonna throw it to you and welcome you to Upper Dublin again. Uh, and thanks for sharing the story of Faith in an Airstream. Thanks, Keith. It is great to be back. I can say that because like Keith said, I, I got to uh, be with you all years ago, maybe almost a decade ago, which is really, really wild to just see. Uh, for I guess all of you from Upper Dublin to know, I've been a fan of your congregation and all the things you've continued to do in Upper Dublin, in the Philly area, in person, online for this whole decade. So it is an honor to be among you here uh, in your online space. And uh, yeah, Keith, that I think was the last time Chelsea and I ate at a restaurant was when we had brunch with you and Jenny in Savannah. So we were just talking about the other day ago as well. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen to show you some slides I put together. Um, th this kind of conversation will be called Faith in an Airstream. Let me hit the right button, see if it happens. Presto, I think you can all see that. All right. Um, uh, I'm going to tell a bit about my story that my wife and I took on for this past year and kind of the, the faith spiritual lens that I kind of tend to apply to everything. Um, so we'll get to kind of just talk together about this. And I think you'll quickly see that as much, much of what I'm kind of talking about living in an Airstream, chances are you're probably not doing that. But much of what we talk about will still be very pertinent to the way we all live uh, in the world around us. So. As Keith said, um, my name is uh, Reverend Jim Keat. I am a pastor at Riverside, that really tall church there, uh, and I'm the director of online learning at Convergence. So basically, I do my best to help churches do everything they can to be the church in these online spaces. Uh, I, I believe it was talking with Keith a decade ago where I first Probably, probably stole it from Keith, let's be honest, where, where I first kind of stumbled upon the phrase, virtual isn't the opposite of real, it's the opposite of physical, they're both real, and so these virtual spaces are very real spaces. So that's, that's the world I live in, in helping churches and people um, live in these online spaces to connect in very real ways. But we're not talking about church online, that's what I do on Mondays. Uh, Keith has been a great guest at some of those as well. I want to talk about faith in an airstream, and so the first thing to talk about is what my wife and I called our adventure. We had this itch to leave New York City. I no longer live in the city. I'm actually not in the Airstream right now either, if you can't tell. Pandemic, number one, and we're pregnant, number two. So we kind of took a little pause on full-time Airstream life. But our Airstream adventure, we called it free and simple. Uh, and we were thinking, what is a phrase that captures not just how we wanna live in an Airstream full-time, but just how we want to live, period. Free and simple. Now. Free does not mean it doesn't cost anything because we still live in a world with capitalism and Airstreams are um, costly. But we wanted to be unbound. We didn't want to be stuck in one location. We wanted to have the ability to see the world, to see the diversity of people in this world and to get to know them for who and where they are. 
And then simple was the big one. We, we didn't want to be fettered down by stuff, by things, by all the, the wanting and getting and having and keeping. I mean, there's a whole spirituality of stuff right there we could dive into. But for us, we needed something to kind of push us into uh, moving from being aspiring minimalists to a constraint that forced us to actually be minimalists. And when you go from an apartment, even though it's a small one bedroom apartment in New York City, to an Airstream with less than 200 square feet for your entire home, you learn to be pretty simple. But more than just this adventure of minimalism, the, the name Free and Simple, the whole kind of impetus for what we wanted to do came from a quote from Catherine of Siena. When one of her prayers, she says, eternal God, let our cloud be dissipated so that we may perfectly know and follow your truth in truth with a free and simple heart. And so for us, this whole adventure, it was really a, a very radical, drastic way of saying, can we take that seriously? Can we do have a free and simple heart with what we do in all of our lives? And yes, you can do this from anywhere. So that's where I think this is a, already number one, living a free and simple life doesn't require moving into an Airstream, but we, we wanted to try this drastic thing to take that on in such a radical and serious way and to see what we would learn along the way. So it took for us a leap of faith. Uh, we, we literally, there you see my wife Chelsea in front of our Airstream, literally leaping. Uh, that's Patrick Botticelli, who's the greatest Airstream salesman in probably the country out of Colonial Airstream in New Jersey. Uh, we didn't know what an Airstream was. Well, I'd seen them. And one day we were going camping in uh, upstate New York. We had to rent a car. It's a whole thing when you live in Manhattan. And we were talking about what's the next chapter of our lives going to be. And we talked about what if we could just travel more? What if we could just take our cats? We have two cats. We didn't want to leave them behind and just see the country and see how beautiful it is and see people in the north and the south and the east and the west and get to know them for people, not just for headlines or stereotypes. And so I said, what about an Airstream? And Chelsea goes, what's an Airstream? So we Googled it and found the nearest Airstream dealer and we went there the next weekend. And within a matter of months, we had bought that Airstream you see there on screen. It took us a little while to actually move into it. This was in the fall, we moved into it in the summer. Uh, but it was this leap, this let's try this. Uh, and for me, that always made me think of, you know, whether it's Abraham's story in Genesis where and Abram went, I think that's three little words and Abram went, but it's such a significant inciting point in the story of Abraham. People didn't leave their hometown in that ancient Near East culture that Abraham was in. For Abraham to leave, that's a huge, that's not just a step, that's a leap. And so that was part of it for us often the hardest part of doing anything new, whether it's something you feel called by God to do or just this next adventure you are itching to take, the first step can so often be the hardest part. And so we decided we're, we're not gonna just tiptoe, we are gonna just all out leap into this adventure. I'm gonna read this prayer from Catherine of Siena one more time. Eternal God, let our cloud be dissipated so that we may perfectly know and follow your truth with a free and simple heart. My wife actually um, kind of connected with that prayer even before we met or re-met. We had met ages ago, but before we kind of started dating and before we were married. And so it was fun to kind of have that be brought in because I'm, I'm the pastor one. So it was fun to have this adventure for us kind of have a spiritual center that we both brought to it. So it was a leap of faith. We were doing something completely new. And at times when you do something you've never done before, it is exactly that. It's a big leap and you just need to trust and to take that, that leap knowing that God will be with you every step of the way, even when it's something new. Which, which leads us very practically to another example. There's my wife, in case you wanted to see her. Uh, Jesus, take the wheel. Uh, that, that's, you know, we say that in our general colloquialism of, of American Christianity sometimes when things are getting a little out of control or something perhaps. But for us, this was a very practical prayer when we had to tow our home. We had to pull our home, all 8,000 pounds of it, and everything we owned. And here's the thing, neither one of us had ever towed anything before. So no pressure, right? Uh, the image at the bottom on the bottom right there is from our very first time taking it onto the highway. 
We took it from the dealer in New Jersey, and that's the New Jersey Turnpike, which maybe is not what I'd recommend first time RV towers do when they're taking a, a travel trailer out. It's this huge 14 lane highway. Uh, and we survived, but we learned that um, you have to just trust, trust the, 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 uh, the help you've received from others, trust the resources you've read to learn from, uh, to first get help to have those experts with you. I mean, so anything new you're doing, whether it's a new adventure, a new aspect of your faith, you don't have to do it alone. And so we actually had great um, kind of instructions on how to tow. The dealer gave us a whole tutorial. They took us to a parking lot for a couple hours and taught us a whole lot of things. But then more than that, really, at some point, you can say the prayer, Jesus, take the wheel. But the reality is, you know, God has hands. They're attached to our wrists right here. So Jesus, take the wheel means, okay, God is with me while I'm holding the wheel. And you just got to learn by doing it. So we ended up driving about 10,000 miles total in our first nine month adventure all over the East Coast. And we got really good at towing. Actually, my wife became the one who did most of the towing. Uh, we like to say we tow like a girl is a good thing in our family. Uh, but anything that's new for us, that prayer of Jesus take the wheel was just a way of realizing that God was empowering us to do this thing that in some ways felt, you know, intimidating and was just a simple part of getting from where we are to where we knew we needed to be. And it was, it turned out to be a lot of fun. Backing in, however, is a whole other prayer. And we'll save that for another conversation because that's still, a, we got, I got better at that, but that's still a bit of a learning curve. So we, we took this leap of faith. We, we found ourselves gripping the wheel and learning these new things that we were called to do. And then really for us, the, the sense of where you go versus how you get there. This became very um, present with us in all of our travels. You see the, the map there that's on our door of our Airstream, and we filled in the, the states of every place we spent the night at a campground. So we kind of just stuck on the East Coast. We have family in Michigan, which is where I'm currently staying. We saw family in Myrtle Beach, North Carolina. We spent a couple months down in Florida. And then like Keith had said, we were in Savannah, Georgia area for a bit, got to see Keith and Jenny. Um, but everywhere we went, we, we have some friends who travel full time in their travel trailers and they will like drive eight hours a day and they'll make it across the country in like a week. We went a bit slower. We would go maybe four hours max driving time. We would try to do even two or three hours. And really we would pick where we knew we needed to be. And it was largely because of like some sort of a gathering we had to be at, whether it was family or an event. Uh, and then we just kind of looked at the map and broke it up in these small little chunks. And, and that really allowed us to be present in those little spaces. It wasn't just about where we were going. For us, it was about how are we going to get there? How are we going to go from here to there? Because the destination isn't always the point. Uh, if it is, I mean, maybe if you really are in a hurry, okay, but let's talk about you know, mindfulness and being present another time then too. For us, we would pick a destination and then break it down and we would spend one to two to three weeks in these little areas in between. So we loved going to national parks and that was often kind of a, a, a terminus for us on our, on our trip. But then we would be in these small little places in Murphy, North Carolina, where there's, you know, a, a Andrews, North Carolina down the street, which I guarantee none of you have been to. If you have, we should talk about that. It's this small little like 800 person town with three breweries and two wineries and a disc golf course and two great local pizza places. And we learned all that because we weren't just trying to get to the next place. We were trying to really get to know the place we were in, to get to know the people, to get to know what it was like here, uh, to not just be perpetually traveling, but to be rooted in some place, even if just for a few weeks at a time. And I, I think about this, you know, kind of in my pastoral, theological, spiritual lens. And I think it's so easy for us to focus on where we're going. Like that's, that's it. The destination is the goal, right? And we completely ignore how we get there, the way in which we get there, the, the moments of being present along the way and realizing that, I mean, maybe it's cliche, but I think it's true. The journey matters just as much, if not even more, than the destination. I mean, the worst thing is to, whether it's some big building decision or church planning thing, or even just thinking about, you know, someday in a, in a place called heaven, if the only goal is the destination and we don't care what happens along the way, oh, 
man, I, I want to remember that heaven is a place on earth. And how can the, how can the journey, how can every step be rooted in peace and love and justice and joy, not just some destination that we hope to get to someday. So national parks are great, but so are the little trails that you only find when you talk to a local at a bar. And, and next, along this journey, we, I talked to a friend of mine who's also a pastor who has an Airstream, and he said something kind of heretical. And did I, can I say this? He said that the Airstream life was better than church. This is my friend Bruce Barnard. If you want to, you know, uh, find him online and, and, and either praise him or curse him for a statement like this. But really what he meant by this was he found that every campground he went to, the online Airstream community was such a close, connected community in ways that church often hopes to be, but sometimes falls short. Now, luckily, Upper Dublin, I know you are right on the top of the list, so we're all good there, but those other churches. Um, no, all this to say, really, we experience a whole lot of this. Church can be full of a lot of things, and we want it to be this community where we're connected with our diversity. Uh, but the Airstream life, for us, traveling full-time, we really found this community wherever we would go. Uh, every time we were in a campground, all these people camping, whether for the weekend or full-time or whatever, but whenever there was another Airstream in the campground, there was always an immediate connection. We were two people who had something we valued in common. So oftentimes we might have a whole lot of other different points of view. I had some very interesting political conversations as I was traveling through the South, but it gave me this sense of we can start a conversation. We can, we can begin talking. Uh, and there's just, again, here we are online, there's so many real connections to be made online. That bottom image there is a thumbnail from a YouTube video my wife and I made where we wrote a song about living in an Airstream and all those people you see pictured there, we've never met any of them in person, but we got to know all these and so many more other people who live in an Airstream and they helped us write a song together and we put it online, it was a lot of fun. And so many of these people we still keep in touch with months and months later. Once in a while, you do get to meet up in person, you have drinks or go out for dinner, and it's just this amazing connection where you realize community can be found in so many places. And what does it mean for us to truly be connected? It makes me think, you know, in the book of Acts, it talked about the, the, the early church, they gathered together and they had everything in common. Now, that phrase can be really taken a couple of ways, at least when we just glance at it. They had everything in common, probably li li literally means they shared everything they had but you know, you can look at it and say, oh, they had everything in common. Well, what is it they shared in common? What was that thing that drew them together that sparked the work they were called to do? At church, you know, we call that love and justice and creativity and generosity and the work of God in the world. And we found in our Airstream travels, this love for being outdoors and for traveling allowed us to connect with people in true and meaningful ways, even if it was just for a week or two in person, and then all, not, all over the place online on YouTube and Instagram and Facebook, which is kind of like how we all do church now. So it's a really, really good experience. And, and one last thing to touch on before we kind of open up and have more of a conversation about this, our Airstream journey, this faith in an Airstream, finding God along the way, really finding God in the sunrise and the sewer hose. Now, for those of you who've never lived in or traveled or stayed in a travel trailer, an RV, well, you know, there's this hose. It's in the middle of the picture there. You connect it to the black tank. Gray tank is for like dishwater. Black tank is for, yep, you guessed. And it goes and it goes into the sewer and you have to pull a thing to empty it every day, which is an interesting experience you don't really think about when you live in a house. You're used to just kind of flush the toilet, not this two-step process called empty the sewer. So it's a very unique experience to do daily when you're living full-time in an Airstream and to have it surrounded by these moments of sunrise. Often in the morning I would go out with the sunrise and empty the sewer hose. There's such a contrast of beauty that you are so eager to experience and then this like uh, kind of reality. And, and that was kind of the, the, the lived experience overall where you might think of traveling and living full-time in an Airstream is this like, oh, you just got to see all the amazing things and you were always on vacation. Well, no, I had to work full-time. I still have a full-time job. But there were moments of living in, finding God in both parts of that tension. You know, seeing those 
gorgeous sunrises that you can see when you're in a new location every few weeks. But then also knowing that there's the reality of the day to day. And sometimes it involves pulling a lever to let your sewer hose do its thing. Can you find God in the midst of all of that when it's going great and when it's going not so great in the moments that you really look forward to and the moments that you're like, Ugh. well, the beauty is, uh, I think of a passage in Genesis uh, 28, I think it's 28. Uh, I think I'm preaching on it this summer, so I better know. Jacob is running away from home from Esau, and he's heading to his uncle's house, and he sleeps on a rock for a night. Not really the best choice for a pillow, Jacob, but we'll talk about that later. And he wakes up after hearing Led Zeppelin pay, play in his dreams, Stairway to Heaven, and he says, God was in this place, and I, I did not know it. Even in those moments of running from your brother and sleeping on a rock, God is right there under the rock. I think this idea of radical imminence, where God is not some faraway being, but God is the ground of being. God is in the sunrise and in the sewer hose. God is there when things are going great, and even when things are just all sewer. Uh, that's the kind of faith I want to have, I hope we all have, and as we did our, as we traveled through the east coast of the country for nine months, uh, whether it was sunrises or sewer hoses or our, our very second week out, the power went out in the campground, which was an interesting experience. Um, all sorts of things can go wrong, but what are you going to do when things don't go as planned? Can you still have eyes to see God in the midst of those moments? So traveling full-time in an Airstream, it reminded me to, to take that leap of what I felt God was calling us towards, to trust as Jesus takes the wheel, knowing that it's still me holding on to the wheel, but God is with me to go slowly along the way, to be present in every step and not just focus on where I'm going, but focus on how I'm getting there, to discover a community of people who share things in common, even if we've never even talked up until this moment, and then to find God in all of these moments, the sunrise, the sewer hose, and everything in between. And that is our free and simple adventure that we started almost exactly a year ago and it's on pause because like I said, we're having a baby. So hold on because we're gonna have round two coming up soon once this kid, you know, maybe gets, gets a few nights sleep under his belt and then we'll hit, head down the road and do some part-time air streaming all over Michigan. Well, let's also get the pandemic a little, a little safer too. Two things to figure out, pandemic and pregnancy. Once they're both kind of in the clear, then our free and simple adventure will continue. Great, thank you, Jim. And, um, and we're gonna just have some questions and conversation with Jim now. So um, you can um, turn your video on and uh, unmute if you have a question for Jim. So say, I'm so terribly sorry about the, the Zoom bombing. We thought we had taken uh, steps to prevent that. We've, I've had other ministry friends for that that's happened to. Um, and we thought we had um, the right things in place. So we're gonna revisit that and uh, make sure. But this meeting is now locked. Everybody who's here is here. Nobody else can get in. Um, it's good to see your faces uh, popping up here. And uh, if you have a question, um, feel free to unmute and uh, and let it rip. Uh, Jim? Yes. This is Dottie Long. I'm so talk to me about you. What do you think, Keith? Well over a year, if not more? <laughs> I'm anyway, always talking about you. Uh, <laughs> I, I work at Upper Dublin, director of adult ed, but my question to you is this. In, in this uh, time uh, that you have spent in the Airstream, what have you discovered about yourself mm. uh, that you can uh, share with us? <laughs> <laughs> well, number one, my wife and I still love each other and probably are even closer <laughs> friends than we were when we started. Um, which is a real risk in these kinds of things. We're, we were living in 200 square feet every day together. Um, I, I think more than anything, I learned that I, I never needed as many things as I thought. Uh, oh. It's incredibly possible. I mean, that's different for different people, but I was able to be so, not just content, maybe not even satisfied is the right word, but just totally appreciative and finding joy in the simplicity of things as I pared down my wardrobe to you know enough that would fit in the overhead storage of the Airstream which is not very big by the way uh, 
I think uh, eliminating some of those choices in my life allowed me to spend more time enjoying those sunrises and those morning walks and campfires with new friends. Um, so it, it, it was the experiment of what happens if we go completely radical, what it, it really focused me in on the goodness and the love and the joy. And I'm glad that I can know I can be content in all of those situations. Well, thank you. That's good to hear. I'm sure Becca Ehrlich would be happy to hear that too. <laughs> Our Christian minimalist friend. Yeah. <laughs> Other questions for Jim? Yeah, Sue. Yeah, uh, yeah I had a question. Um, thanks so much. That was great to think about all, you know, I was just curious, where, how did you decide where you were going to stop or what your journey was going to look like? Yeah, so we, uh, well, we, we had a couple of decisions. A lot of people when they live in an Airstream or travel trailer, they'll go off the grid completely. Um, we, we did not do the whole boondocking thing. We did it once, kind of. We had electric only for two weeks when we were camping with our family at a state park in Michigan, which was great. We were like literally feet from Lake Huron. I'd go kayaking in the morning with my coffee. It was amazing. But we largely picked places with full hookups because this was our full-time home and we wanted to flush the toilet in our house and that kind of a thing. So that, that kind of meant we were looking for places along the road that would give us places to stay. But really, we would kind of pick a national park and say, okay, we're going to go from Michigan to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, Congaree National Park. How do we get there? And where are the kind of fun places to stop along the way? And we would just look. There's a resource called Campendium, which is like a website full of campground reviews. Half the time, we would just do Google Maps and search RV park and then find the ones that looked fun or interesting or were near trails or let's be honest we found look for ones that were near breweries often too <laughs> uh, and then we would just stay there for at least a week sometimes even two weeks at a time to really get to know the space sometimes we're like oh we're itching to go to the next place and that's a good discipline too how do you stay where you are even when you're like i need to move and at other times it would allow us to discover a new trail system or to meet a new friend because we were in that place for a little bit longer of time but really, it was just a lot of Google searching. We would, we would kind of map out our trips well in advance. We would kind of have four to six months of trips planned where we were going to stay because our kind of, now we're getting into just travel philosophy. For us, we decided it was much easier to change plans at the last minute than it was always to make plans at the last minute. Now, that, that's true for all of life, I think. Never mind. So that was generally how we did it. Thank you. Of course. Oh, I think I see Dottie's lips moving, but I'm, I'm, I see, I think you're muted still. <laughs> Zoom is teaching me to be a really good lip reader, or it's reminding me that I need to learn to be a good lip reader. <laughs> Dottie, I unmuted you. Oh no, and you just did it, sorry. <laughs> well, well, there we go. Thank All you. right. My question, Jim, was what pushed you out the door to do this? Yeah, okay. I think largely, I'd been living in New York for almost 10 years, maybe nine years. And then my wife had been there with me for about three years after we got married. Um, and we both loved to travel. She had been traveling through Europe before we started dating. And then um, to tra and we spent some time in Europe. So traveling was always an itch we had. Uh, and I... I I was definitely more connected to the life and energy of the city than my wife was. But at the same time, I, my favorite place in New York City was always Central Park, this giant big green rectangle yeah. in the middle of all this concrete uh, to find this oasis away from the noise and the buildings and everything that comes with it. And we always found ourselves just itching to get out of the city whenever we could. So we really just were like, what if, what if we just left but didn't just leave this city to go to another one what if we left it to really see all of this outdoor we want to see and we were talking about it for like almost a year and a half kind of like the idea and then it wasn't until we really were kind of focusing in on she was finishing her master's in fine arts so we're like looking at that as kind of a finish line of something like okay what's coming after that that doesn't require us to be in the city anymore for her coursework where are we going to go and then I was able to pitch to Riverside that my job become remote as the digital minister. So those things lining up, her finishing a degree and my employer saying, yeah, we think this could be a fun experiment. Let's have you go travel around and connect with our online congregation and community. Those kind of gave us the 
permission or the possibility to do it. And so we said, well, why not? This is probably the only time we're ever going to get that to do this. And if we don't take this chance now, we're just going to wait around for it to come again. I don't, I don't want to sit on my hands when we have this chance ahead of us. So we just jumped and we said, let's do it. Let's, let's go all in and see where it takes us. And now, like I said, we're in an apartment in a small town in Michigan, near my wife's family, near my family. But we are grateful for what we've done, largely because of the community it connected us to. Uh, we now know how to tow an Airstream. So when we do that again, we're not going to be like, Jesus, take the wheel. We'll be like, Jesus, you want to sit in the back seat? We got this one. Don't be a backseat driver. Jesus is always a backseat driver, let's be honest. That's okay. <laughs> anyway, that's kind of what pushed us on the edge. We were just, we just decided we didn't want to keep waiting. It's easy to just live your life waiting. We were like, no, let's, let's try it. That's, why, why not? That's, that's very philosophical about <laughs> waiting. I like that. <laughs> I wish my parents had understood that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was the thing too. We were so curious what our friends and family were going to think when we told them we were doing this. And I think by and large, our family was just like, yeah, that makes sense. Seems like who you are. And we're like, oh, okay, good. My sister lives near where they make Airstreams in Ohio. And she was like, ooh, Airstreams, they're amazing. I drive by them every day on my way to work. We're like, oh, this is really good support from our family. We thought they were going to be questioning these decisions, but we had, we had a good support system. And they all love that we got to come see them because we'd been far away from family in New York for a while. So now it let us travel and be near family and friends. And I'm, in some ways, I'm a little not surprised by that people were so um, encouraging because I think it's an amazing idea. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just like so cool to, you know, uh, to be able to, to have that kind of experience. I mean, that's why we've talked for some time about having you come and join us for something like this because I just think um, a lot of us, you know, some of us like to camp, some, a lot of us like to travel, but um, just the idea of just being able to pick up and, uh, and, and go and, yeah. and figure out, oh, where do we want to go next is pretty a cool thing, especially when you're trapped in quarantine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we're all thinking about where we want to go first. <laughs> I, I've heard from Airstream that their sales are through the roof right now. Everyone is like, oh, how can I travel safely and have all the control over my environment? Oh, so. Oh, my gosh. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. They didn't pay me to say that to you, by the way. I promise. <laughs> what did you do for food? Did you eat out mostly, or did you mostly cook in, or combination of both, or how was that? Great, great question, Gail. We would uh, most of the time cook in. We would cook all our meals there. It has, you know, a three top, sto three burner stove, gas stove, full oven. Well, not full. It's definitely smaller than the ovens you have in your homes. Um, but you know, we could. I do most of the dinner cooking. Every night I cook dinner and I love cooking dinner and I could cook pretty much anything and everything. Enchiladas, stir fry, you know, we're, we're vegans and vegetarians. So we, we didn't do any, you know, steaks and chicken, but you know, there lots of, you know, like tofu scrambles and uh, muffins baked in the, in the oven there or things over a campfire here and there. Um, but it definitely let us cook the way we cooked in New York. It felt like, whoa, we went from a small kitchen in New York to a small kitchen in wherever we park it. This is kind of nice. But then yes, we would eat out, mainly if we were in a place where we knew there was something unique we wanted to try. It was never just like, it's a vacation, let's eat out every night. That's just not tenable, especially not on a pasture salary. Uh, so it was more of a, oh, look, we really want to try that place. We began reviewing breweries based on their um, pretzel and cheese. That was kind of our fun little hobby. And then my wife got pregnant, so we stopped going to breweries as much. Um, but yeah, we would cook pretty much every meal. Great. Thank you. We kind of did the same thing as you, but only in two-week stretches. Okay. A lot of bicycling. Of course, we did motel camping, you know. <laughs> we could, uh, you know, sleep at night and uh, have some place to soak our bones that were, that were aching. Yeah, I should say, but uh, I would find a lot of trails that piqued my interest. Yeah, trails uh, that were like Trail of the Monks, mm. where I how I would set up the map of where we were going, but didn't know what we were going to find when we got there. And a lot of them were great. And we've gone all the way out to Missouri. Wow at different times but every year we would do something like that and then uh, we can't do it anymore 
Yeah. Yeah. But uh, your story is interesting. I enjoy it. Ray, it sounds like you've got some great stories too. I, I, I love even just the tip of the iceberg you're opening up right now. I love it. I love it. We do. <laughs> Jim, could you talk more about what you said in the very beginning about not where you're going, but how you're getting there? Because it, it made me think of a professor I had who I adored, and he always told us the questions were better than the answers. Yeah, yeah, it's the same idea, you know. Yeah, yeah, and how that impacted on your life, not just driving to a place, but just how you perceive life now. Yeah, well, I have to be honest. So I, I have a tattoo here on this wrist of a labyrinth. You can kind of stare, uh, there you can kind of see a little better. Basically, my entire, my entire cool. life and faith is on my arms somewhere, um, but this one is a prayer labyrinth that I put on my wrist and I got it just before I was moving to New York and I knew it was going to be this fast paced frantic city and I was going to be spending time commuting here and there on a subway and I wanted a way to just physically I could see it as a reminder to smile breathe and go slowly which is a quote from Thich Nhat Hanh a Buddhist monk uh, but then I also wanted it to be practical, where I could actually trace it with my finger, and it could be an actual practice I did in the midst of whatever was happening around me. My Aww. niece calls it my arm maze. She'd be like, Uncle Jim, can I do your arm maze? I go, not with the Sharpie this time. Uh, <laughs> but I, I, I've always needed these reminders to just be present in a world that wants us to always be thinking of five other things that we still need to work on. You know, there's always another thing that you forgot to put on your to-do list that never seems oh, to get Lord, cleared. Oh, you're talking to me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so for me, I think it, that that's, I'm aware of that reality. That's part of our life period and traveling, it can definitely impose its way in. I'm also a firm believer that how you do anything is how you do everything. Like if you want to, you know, get to know somebody, just go sit in their car and see how their car is. This, you know, space that's usually private. It's like, oh, and I'll admit there are weeks when we have a truck now. It's like, oh, yep, the back seat needs a little TLC because that's my week has been frantic. So I knew going into traveling, we could just live this fast paced, go, 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 go life. But that would be completely antithetical to what we were trying to do. We weren't trying to become Buddhist monks. We were trying to just become the best humans we could be as we traveled the places we were going. And part of it was practical. We just, we tried some weeks with some longer trips and we realized, oh, that just wasn't fun. It didn't feel good. Like on our bodies to be sitting in the truck for so long, the stress of like, okay, highway, here we go. We have two cats who we would take everywhere. So we didn't like what it put them through. We didn't like having to get to a place late and it was getting close to the sunset we wanted to like enjoy sunset. So we tried to make decisions to allow us to enjoy as many moments as we could. Uh, we would take these shorter trips. We actually, for, for two months from Michigan to Myrtle Beach, where we, along the way, we did Mammoth Cave, um, Smoky Mountain National Park and Congaree National Park, which are incredible. Congaree is one of the, the lowest attended national parks in the country, but it's gorgeous and incredible. We, we went all these places and we traveled every single week. Every Monday, we would leave and go to a new spot, which for some full-time RVers is like a slow pace. They do the whole like eight hours in a day and then they go stay a night, eight hours the next day. Whew. We even discovered one week was too much. We felt like we were just always packing up and moving. Every Monday was a moving day. We never got to go back to our favorite place. That's where we really began saying, Let's do two weeks or three weeks or four weeks at a place just so we could get to know the places around us and we realized the impact it had on our bodies, on our, just our, the way we were present with ourselves and with one another. So I guess it was kind of a philosophical approach of slow down in the midst of a fast paced world and then just a practical trial and error realizing, oh, going fast doesn't feel good. Can I do the thing that makes me enjoy life a little more and discover the undiscovered and unknown benefits from it. So that's a long answer to a very short question. <laughs> um, good, good answer. Thank you. Yeah. Jim, I know you have to get going because you have another church thing that you have to get to <laughs> this morning, right? 
I do a little afternoon. I'm, I'm not, I, I got a good, you know, five, even to 10 minutes or so, maybe, maybe five minutes high safer, but I think I'm peeking over at our online service. They're on the closing hymn. So I got, <laughs> I got a solid five minutes to go. Uh, well, uh, does anybody else have kind of a, a final question that you might want to uh, wrap us up on? Any questions out there? Just want to thank you so much, Jim. It was very interesting. And thank you for doing this for us. You're welcome, Gail. Great, Thanks. both of you. Great to hear a glimpse of your story as well. <laughs> we got a lot of stories. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the best thing. The only way you get stories is if you take that step and try it. That's true for life, for faith, for anything. If you just sit on your hands, you're, you're not, what's the story you're going to tell? I mean, so it doesn't mean go crazy and do a thousand things. Still be present, go slow, be where you are, but you got to go. I mean, therefore go is an important part of that Matthew 25 passage. And Abram went. If it was and Abram stayed, come on, what's the story there? The Genesis is done. Abraham isn't a character. We move on. So I really mean it when I say Upper Dublin is a community I often speak fondly of. I, I know you largely through your minister, Keith, and, uh, and the work and the things I see you doing online. You, and the new website, by the way, very nice. Uh, <laughs> I, I am truly a fan and a support and an encourager of everything you're doing in all of your corners of the world. Thank you, Jim. This was really great. Um, Got to imagine being out on the open road for, uh, <laughs> instead of just walking back to my house. <laughs> uh, Dream and, uh, on. <laughs> so, yeah, so thanks for helping us dream and think about uh, our own, calling up our own stories of uh, travel. Uh, it helps us to, I think, looking back on, I talked about today at church, but looking back on some of our travels. Absolutely. A really Absolutely. great thing. So thanks for calling up some of those stories in us um, for us to kind of reflect on too and looking at where, where God was at work or how God is at work in the midst of that. Absolutely. So wonderful to get to spend this time with you all. Look forward to seeing you again, whether it's online or even in person again someday. <laughs> I'll meet you in Savannah. <laughs> I'll see you there. <laughs> thanks, everyone. It's so right. wonderful to be with you. I'll Thank see you, everybody. Thanks for being Bye. here. Take care.